you know the space uh, domain the uh, expanding space domain has actually diminished the demarcation between air space and the outer space uh, at the closer orbital ranges satellites are being launched into the very low earth orbits you also got the uh, haps that is the high altitude pseudo satellites uh, along with uh, balloons and high altitude drones which are being used to exploit this domain that is the near space uh, region and uh, the ambiguity between air space and near space is even more predominant with uh, the proliferation proliferation of aerial platforms in the near uh, space region and uh, which actually can fly over the adversary's air space and yet not violate uh, his uh, you know uh, sovereignty and be able to exploit the same for their own uh, advantage uh, it it could operate in this ambiguous region which is the near space uh, region where detection and targeting cap capabilities are still in the process of uh, maturing and this domain is well within the operating jurisdiction of an aerospace force and uh, the point that i would like to make is that the indian air force uh, must develop capabilities in this near space region for isr communication real time data links and uh, targeting of the aircraft uh, coming to why is uh, the uh, emergence of space uh, as a military domain gaining prominence because this near space is it's very lucrative it's a best of both worlds where there are no regulations presently being enforced over here uh, and the transition of air defense uh, to the aerospace defense where you've got higher ranges of you know uh, missiles higher altitudes of airplanes higher ranges of uh, radars detection ranges and intercepts including the uh, ballistic missile defense uh, and therefore the air defense has to expand from the air to this region into the suborbital space now any conflict on land uh, sea and air will also spill over into the space domain and uh, therefore protection against counter measures becomes necessary in this uh, uh, domain it's a thin line of demarcation between air defense and space defense especially against kinetic launched uh, space uh, weapons we also need to look at uh, the uh, stm which is a space traffic management because altitude above flight level 460 are exclusively uh, for the air force that is the military aircraft to fly and uh, routine monitoring of this domain that is uh, the uh, it would require an extension of the air defense capability uh, this is becoming a global norm if you see across the world and military agencies can track military as well as civilian objects in this region and take actions against set procedures where uh, you know uh, where a probably civil agency will not be able to do this work now uh, venturing into space or outer space if you look at it historically uh, this has been an outcome of military requirements uh, from the time that the uh, v2 rockets were launched the initial objective was to you know gain more height for isr intelligence surveillance and recce and uh, the development actually took place to locate the icbms in the cold war era between uh, the erstwhile soviet union and the united states uh, i i just make a mention here that india is the only country where we developed rockets for launching satellites into space unlike the western countries where the lock, the rockets were developed as offensive weapons to target enemy countries and this is how the v2 rockets uh, you know were designed which carried out attacks during uh the second world war and the first satellites that were used for military and recce communication and thereafter uh the benefits were supposed to be for the society in terms of uh, economic and science scientific benefits and the upliftment of society actually this uh, you know the concept of uh, and asat is uh, is not new it has been there ever since 1959 when the bold orion was launched you know that Uh, air launched ballistic missiles on the uh, B47 uh, bomber against the explorer 6 satellite uh, subsequently in the 80s you had the uh, uh, sdi that is the strategic uh, defense initiative during the reagan era which was also known as uh, star wars 
and uh, again countermeasures towards uh, the uh, Soviet ICBMs. F-15, the famous uh, launch uh, of uh, air launch ballistic missile by an uh, F-15 that destroyed a US uh, dead satellite. And it was much later during the Gulf uh, War that the US uh, actually demonstrated how uh, satellite applications could be used to get an overwhelming advantage over a terrain which was unfamiliar and at uh, long distances from their own country, also dubbed as the first uh, space war. Uh, subsequently, the war in Kosovo and, uh, uh, you know, where uh, the NATO used 86 satellites uh, for C4, ISR and GPS uh, for navigation and terminal guidance. And, uh, uh, if you look at the conflict which took place from the Gulf War to uh, Kosovo, Kosovo operations of uh, Allied force, uh, the use of GPS and the use of precision weapons increased from 10% to almost 60 to 70% in the subsequent years. And also, uh, uh, there was a reduction in the sensor to shooter time because of the availability of satellites which from 24 hours uh, in the first Gulf War came down to as less than, as, you know, uh, less than 11 minutes. There's a point that uh, was made in the previous session about uh, uh, capability. Uh, we may have the capability, but unless we have the capacity, we will not be able to achieve what we want to achieve. And this need was felt in our situation during the uh, Cargill War when we realized that we could not get satellite imagery on demand. And that is why the acceleration uh, in this uh, field happened. Uh, what was the revelation was actually in 2007 when uh, China launched its uh, ASAT, which uh, actually served as a wake-up call and, uh, and India when, uh, you know, took cognizance of this and uh, uh, launched Mission Shakti in uh, 2019 to convey its uh, intention and the ability and the capacity it had to take action against uh, satellites in uh, space. Coming to the uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, actually Russia demonstrated this ASAT uh, test even before the conflict started in February, uh, uh, I mean 21 and it tested a kinetic ASAT in uh, November uh, 21. This was a political will. Uh, you know, by the Russians to tell the uh, Americans or uh, the NATO forces that, uh, you know, please stay away or it showed its deterrence uh, capability. As the conflict began, there were cyber operations that were take, taking place. Uh, Russia conducted a cyber uh, attack on the Viasat uh, satellite and Ukraine military was heavily dependent upon this uh, for communications and that is why Starlink came in and uh, Elon Musk, you know, on the uh, request of the Ukrainian minister, gave these facilities to the uh, Ukrainians, uh, wherein they started utilizing the, uh, uh, these satellites for even operating their drones and all. And then when Russia issued a warning that, you know, if you do this, then we are, we are going to take offensive action, they took some action to prevent these satellites from being used for operating, actively uh, employing drones. Russia actually has been using, uh, you know, uh, disrupting the Starlink, Starlink services through jamming carrying, uh, by carrying it out effectively and uh, SpaceX is countering this with software up updates. So you can see the conflict is, you know, uh, goes from the land to the space domain which affects actually uh, the battle that is being fought on the land. Now, if you look at uh, the military applications uh, of uh, satellites, the, the entire thing is uh, a force, you know, you want to do information, get information dominance. And uh, why do we use space or how do we use space? We use space as a force uh, uh, multiplier and as an enabler. In all these roles, that is communications, earth observation, recce, mapping, uh, navigation, met, early warning, search and rescue, and uh, SIGIN. So, if we are dependent on all these services through the medium of space, obviously we become vulnerable. So, this uh, vulnerability has given rise to ASAT technology. And uh, that is what we are looking at, ASAT, which I will come to later, what are the technologies uh, which are being used, some of which 
have been game changing. RPO, uh, I think uh, this audience I need not explain. Rendezvous and proximity operations is a technology uh, which has increased in precision over the years. You can closely maneuver a satellite, go to very near or close ranges to an adversary satellite and presently for benign use, it is being used for, uh, you know, uh, servicing, on the spot servicing, inspection, refueling and uh, the very fact that a satellite can approach you is actually a security threat. And uh, uh, this has been possible only because of RPO. Basically what you are showing is on orbit servicing, refueling, inspection, active debris removal has been possible because of the technology of uh, RPO. We've also uh, got 3D printing, you know, which is going on in the International Space Station, which is already taking place and uh, by NASA. And uh, multi-material printers are being used to print in zero gravity conditions. Uh, you know, polymers and all are being used, but we're looking at an increase in, uh, I think, some uh, thousands of pounds of equipment is being shipped to NASA for carrying out these works, you know, uh, repair and servicing. When we come to uh, uh, space planes, I think X-37, uh, uh, NASA's X-37B uh, uh, was a fully reusable uh, autonomous space plane with uh, robotic capability which was launched almost 10, I mean 12, 13 years ago in 2010 and it has done long uh, orbital missions over there uh, lasting more than 700 days and this X-37 actually as compared to a RPO can be actively used, uh, you know, uh, to either carry out uh, on-site servicing of friendly satellites or an adversary or even potentially grab and deorbit satellites uh, by, by this aircraft. And uh, uh, when, when you look at historical uh, on-orbit inspection satellites, uh, you know, as compared to them, the X-37 uh, uh, sensor package could be upgraded or modified as required for every mission unlike the satellites which are launched with these capabilities into space. Uh, also existing satellite uh, inspection satellites can uh, access satellites close to their orbital inclination and uh, altitude and uh, uh, the space planes can maneuver beyond the limits of their orbits and actually go wherever uh, you desire them to go. Also uh, you know leading to disabling of an adversary's uh, satellite. And the space plane is the only existing space object which is theoretically capable of delivering weapons from uh, space to targets on Earth and giving it therefore a global strike uh, capability with, with a very low or minimal response uh, time. China presently has projects going on, uh, three projects for space, space planes which are running concurrently and maybe we will see them fructifying you know, during uh, the end of uh, this decade. Uh, quantum communications, uh, China has actually launched this first quantum uh, communication satellite called Vicious, which is uh, demonstrated intercontinental communication between Beijing and uh, Vienna. It was also demonstrated, you know, 1200 kilometers apart uh, communication which cannot be uh, jammed actually. And this is an area where I believe, I, I think audience here would be able to tell us where uh, India has also taken some initiative where the Raman Institute in Bangalore is, uh, you know, along with DRDO is uh, partnering to develop uh, quantum communication for uh, our uh, use that is the, uh, these services over here. Uh, why is space critical for war fighting? This slide actually shows you why space is critical for war fighting and all the reasons mentioned over here, uh, you know, each and every application we cannot do without unless we use satellites and we use the space domain. When we look at threats to the space domain, uh, the threats what we need to concentrate as you see on the right hand side are intentional. The ones on the left which is uh, natural and accidental one cannot do anything about and one has little control over that is space weather impact of <coughs> meteorites and asteroids or collision uh, 
between uh, satellites and debris. Of course, some work can be done for uh, you know debris removal and all for which work is going on. But it is the intentional part that is uh, the jamming ASAT weapons, maneuverable satellites and the uh, directed en energy weapons because uh, there are no laws presently uh, you know which regulate this. Uh, there is no transparency available in the world that is monitoring the space environment as a whole and uh, accident collisions like I said can be avoided through a better uh, you know SSA space situational uh, awareness. These are the kinds of weapons that uh, can be used in the space that is kinetic kill uh, weapons uh, like uh, ASAT proximity operations which I covered about uh, RPO and uh, directed energy weapons use of cyber and uh, electronic uh, means to disable a satellite. Now why, why do we consider space uh, essential for national security reasons? Uh, it is important for the socio-economic well-being of a nation. Uh, these, <coughs> therefore, these have to be protected against uh, disruptions from threats and our national security objectives, therefore, must include protection of our assets, uh, national interest in space. So, what is our national interest in space? Our national interest in space is actually unrestricted space services for civil as well as military uses a secure environment for exploitation of commercial exploitation of the space domain, a booming space economy, freedom of R&D and freedom to explore the domain of space. Now for all this to happen actually, an assurance of a safe and secure space environment, it is essential, it is essential uh, that all the other activities which thrive in space as we have seen uh, from the lessons of the Ukraine war our satellites should not fall prey to attacks by our adversaries and uh, we are well aware of the capabilities of our adversaries uh, some of it was talked about by the previous speaker securing our national interests in space comes under the ambit of space security and therefore the onus of securing this rests with the armed forces uh, this would also involve both defensive as well as offensive mechanisms in space to create not only deterrence but also protect our own infrastructure from attacks uh, in the space. When you look at from uh, an air force or a uh, military perspective, the distinguishing roles are, uh, you know, an enabling role and a securing role. And uh, when this difference gets translated into uh, military space strategy, it needs to be addressed as two distinct uh, verticals, space services and space uh, uh, operations. And uh, this is a two-pronged approach wherein uh, integrating the use of satellite services and the uh, application into its overall strategy for the uh, armed forces. And this is where, uh, like I said, uh, the uh, uh, Mission Shakti uh, was a demonstration that India is actually willing to take a cautious step in this direction towards uh, active protection of its uh, satellites in space. When you look at the uh, uh, elements uh, of a space strategy, uh, like I said, if, if you look at the space operations, the main enabler in uh, orange is the SSA and STM that is uh, space situational awareness <coughs> and space traffic management because unless you have that in place it is unlikely that you will be able to carry out the others that is satellite control space defense missile defense space missions and a responsive launch and i it was heartening to note uh, from uh, secretary dda r and d that there are some steps being taken towards this uh, that is SSA and hopefully in the course of the discussion over the next two days uh, we will come to know about what is being done in this uh, field. Now I just touch upon some of the uh, you know desired capabilities in the space uh, uh, systems. If you look at uh, communications uh, I think uh, you know uh, Air Marshal Court mentioned about the threshold of operations. 
and a threshold of capability that we need to develop below which we uh, consider ourselves as failing. So if you if we look at communications, uh, what what is it that we need? We need global coverage. We need multiple frequencies. We need high bandwidth. We need secure communication, and we need electronic protection measures. If you look at uh, global developments, they have already into more than 100 uh, gigabytes speed, which has been achieved. Uh, you know, through high throughput satellites in orbit, servicing quantum communication technologies there, and you also have low Earth constellations. So, where are we? Is what we need to actually assess ourselves as. When you look at Earth uh, observation and imagery. Uh, we currently have EO, SAR and IR uh, multi-spectral uh, imagery we, and hyperspectral imagery. But we need to look at better submetric resolutions. We need to look at low revisit times. Uh, that means actually have almost near continuous coverage of the area that is of our interest and high repetitivity and also launch on demand uh, capability. Small satellites which should be ready for available, I mean readily available for launch. So this is something that I feel is should be our uh, threshold when you look at this capability. Uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, what is there in the world, you've got visit, visit times of 3 to 4 hours and uh, you've got uh, resolutions of less than, uh, you know, 10, I mean 10 centimeters. You've got uh, global uh, repetitivity of less than an hour, choice of multiple uh, sensors with low LEO constellations. <coughs> Weather observation, uh, we require multiple sensor and bandwidth and frequent updates. And uh, if you look at the global uh, technology which is available, you have almost near real-time updates as far as satellite pictures are concerned. 